Thank you all for being here. Let's open our Bibles and follow very closely. I want to, I want us to exercise discernment and uh, dealing with some of the challenges. Remember, Paul in Second Corinthians chapter ten talks about the fact that that we do battle, and as the song suggested, we're soldiers of the cross, and part of the things that we battle are strongholds. Strongholds hold people into a comfort zone that needs to be torn down. And some of those are religious beliefs that are misguided. One of which that we run into quite often is that of Roman Catholicism. And through the years I have run into numbers, numerous individuals who very sincerely believe that the Roman Catholic Church is the church that you read about in the Bible. I want to demonstrate in the course of this lesson tonight that the reasons why I believe the Bible shows differently, that the Bible does not show that the Roman Catholic Church is the church that you read about in the New Testament. And uh, first of all, I would just simply say, if we can establish this little side point, and this little side point is very, very significant in establishing the truth that we're going to be investigating tonight. That as you look at this truth, is the Bible, or do we have, did they have in the first century, first of all, in the first century, did they have all of the truth? And if you can establish that the early disciples had all of it, then what you have then in the possession of all of that truth early on were no indicators that match Roman Catholicism. So we ask and answer in the process of this lesson tonight whether the early disciples had all of the truth. And if so, is that all in the Scriptures, in the New Testament Scriptures? And if so, do the Scriptures mention the things that are characteristic of the Roman Catholic Church. So when we're looking at this, keep that in mind and I'll, I'll emphasize that point as we go along. First, what is the Roman Catholic Church? The word Catholic is a term that means universal. And it seems like a contradiction when you're saying it's universal but it's, uh, it's located in Rome. Uh, it is a universal. The word Catholic is okay as far as a, a term that describes universal church if you simply mean universal. But once you say Roman universal, then you cease to be talking about the same thing. And it's very important for us to understand that distinction. Yes, Jesus established one universal church. All saved people are added to that one universal body that is universal in its very nature. If you're in it, you're in that universal church. If you've been added to the Lord's church, you're in it. Just by nature of your obedience to the gospel of Christ and the Lord's promise that He adds those to the church who are being saved. Then when you talk about the universal church in that sense, and it's quite common to look at some of the church fathers talking about and using the term Catholic. But they were not talking about Roman Catholic when they used that term. So keep that in your mind as we go along as well. Nothing can be universal and Roman at the same time. It ceases to be universal if it's limited to Roman yeah, Romans are not universal. The Lord's church, though, is characteristic of people from Rome, from Jerusalem, from every part of the, of, the, uh, of the earth, and therefore it is not limited to any particular place. When we talk about a local congregation, like, for example, the Gardendale Church of Christ, we're simply talking about it in the same sense as you read of local churches in the Bible, like the church at Ephesus, church at Corinth, the church at Thessalonica. Those are local churches that belong to the Lord. 
none of those local church would claim that we're the universal church. No, we're not the universal. We're a local church that belongs to Christ. Now, the Roman Catholic Church is characterized by at least five major things. And I want to talk about, I mean, just bring those to your attention. Five distinguishing things about the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church believes that the present Roman Catholic organization in Rome is Christ's one true church established in A.D. 30. It started out in Jerusalem and then along the way it it kind of moved its headquarters to Rome. There is no biblical authority for that and there's no biblical proof that the universal church fashioned itself with an earthly head in Rome. The second thing that's characteristic of the Roman Catholic Church is it believes that the Pope is God's appointed head of the church on earth. In other words, Jesus is the head in heaven, but he needed to have an earthly representative head down here. And the Catholics believe that God appointed an earthly uh, substitute for Jesus, and that is the Pope that's located in Rome. However... You do not read that in the Bible at all. Ephesians chapter 1, for example, talks about Jesus as the head over all things to the church. All things to the church. That means the church looks to Jesus completely and gets all their instructions from Jesus who is the head over all things to the church. And the church is his body. So the church looks to the head for its guidance and its instruction. It is never in the New Testament told to look to a pope in Rome or any other place. And so one of the characteristics of Roman Catholicism is that it believes that the pope in Rome was God's appointed head. That in spite of any evidence in the New Testament... The third thing that is characteristic of the Roman Catholic Church is that it believes the teachings and decrees of the Pope are equal to the Bible and superior to the Bible. The early disciples, though, believed differently. They did not believe that you can go outside of these revelations and get instructions from somebody that's superior to the Bible. So when you turn into your Bible to 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, I want you to notice the language of Paul as he describes the scriptures. He says in 2 Timothy 3 verse 16 that Timothy had known holy scriptures from childhood. And then he makes this statement in verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now get this, that the man of God may be complete. That would be Timothy. And that would be any other man of God. And not exclusively to the Pope, but to to any of God's, uh, God's people the scriptures are going to be complete and thoroughly furnish that man of God to every good work. So the man of God believes the teachings of the scriptures are complete and the decrees of the Pope are not equal to that at all. Nor are the claims of the Pope superior to that because the man of God is completely furnished unto every good work by means of the Scriptures. The fourth tenet of Roman Catholicism is that it believes that the Roman Church is the infallible interpreter of the Scriptures. In other words, you can read your Bible all you want to, but you've got to listen to them interpret it to you because you can't get that message on your own. In other words... Even in the first century, you would, you would need to see, if, if Roman Catholicism were true, you would need to be able to see people reading their Bible and saying, well, 
what does the Pope, what's the leader tell us that this means? But you don't see that. In fact, you see quite the opposite of that. You see such, such terms as uh, you find in Ephesians chapter 3, for example. Ephesians chapter 3, here's Paul writing to a church at Ephesus. These average members of the church could read what Paul wrote and they could understand what Paul wrote. And in fact, they could know exactly what Paul knew. Look at, look at this, Ephesians 3, verse 3. Uh, he says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, by which when you, you Christians at Ephesus, and when you read the few words I wrote, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And that is every average Christian can take the words of the Apostle Paul and know exactly what Paul knew and understand what Paul understood. So this is a, fa- this is a characteristic of the early churches that was not characteristic of Roman, Roman Catholics who believed that you couldn't understand the Bible except you go through some interpreter in the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church. The fifth tenet of Roman Catholicism is that it believes that there are traditions. In other words, you can't read in the Bible uh, in the scriptures of popes and cardinals and that kind of thing. Those are things that just kind of evolved and, and so you have to look at the traditions that were handed down by some of the church fathers. The readings and the uh, writings of those fathers kind of help you see the traditions that built up the Roman Catholic Church. They recognized, therefore, by saying that, that tradition is equal to the Bible in authority... They are recognizing that the Bible itself, the Bible alone, that's by itself, is not sufficient to justify the order you see in Roman Catholicism, the organization and the rituals of the Roman Catholic Church. And so you couldn't take your Bible and learn of that from the Bible, and therefore they're saying you need some other things, some traditions that developed after the writings of the Bible in order to conclude that the Roman Catholic organization is, uh, is right. So that's quite frankly an admission that says that the early disciples were not part of that. They did not believe that kind of thing. In fact, there are some traditions, but they're traditions that come from God, as we'll see in just a moment. So keep in mind those five aspects of Roman Catholicism. And then I want to now tackle the question of whether or not the whole counsel of God, that is everything God wanted us to know, everything God wanted us to believe, did he deliver that in the first century so that those second and third century writings are not the counsel of God to us. The counsel of God is given in the first century, not in the second, third, and fourth centuries, or even in the fifth and sixth centuries when some of the things in Roman Catholicism developed. So the whole whole counsel, we want to establish first of all, in regard to God's counsel, all of it, the whole thing, Was it revealed and preached by the apostles and prophets of the first century? Did they say that they preached it all? Did they claim that they preached it all? And if they did uh, claim that, where is the proof of that? Well, let's look at that. In Acts chapter 20, verse 27, listen to this expression of Paul to the elders of Ephesus. They came to meet him at Miletus. And here, among many other things that Paul mentioned to them, he makes this very direct claim. Acts 20, verse 27. 
For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. When you get the whole counsel of God, what's left for later centuries to develop? Well, nothing. When you got the whole thing, there is nothing else that's going to be delivered later on as far as any directive from God is concerned. They believe that they revealed it and they preached that whole counsel of God even as early as Acts 20 verse 27. Second of all, that's what Jesus told his apostles would happen by means of the aid of the Holy Spirit as was pointed out in class this morning in John chapter 16 verse 13 where Jesus promised his apostles that the Holy Spirit would guide you into all truth. When you got all truth, how much is lit missing? Well, nothing. Nothing's missing if you got all the truth and you're preaching the whole counsel. There's nothing left to reveal. Then you look at first or second Peter chapter one, second Peter chapter one, verse three. He says, as His divine power has given to us all things. How how much is left out of that? Well, nothing's left out. He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All of these things are given to us through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. In other words, you've got it all, and if you operate on the basis of that, you will understand everything the Lord wanted you to know about the truth that he holds you responsible to believe and know. Another thing, while preaching the whole council in the first century, they also warned about apostasy, that is, departures from that. In the reading just a moment ago, let's flip back to that 1 Timothy chapter 4 and look at this again, keeping in mind. They had the whole counsel of God on the one hand, and then they had departures from that. So let's read again, 1 Timothy 4 verse 1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith. Notice the exclusive nature of this body of belief. This body of teaching that we're calling the faith, the thing that we're supposed to believe. Some are going to depart from that. How do you depart from it? You know where it is, you know what's involved in it, and then you decide that that's not enough. If you decide that it's not enough, then you have departed from it because it teaches you that it is enough, that it provides thoroughly, it provides the man of God thoroughly. Uh, Under every good work. While preaching the whole council in the first century, they warned about departures from the faith. Notice also that when you do that, you are listening to deceiving spirits. In other words, you've got the faith, but you want something more, and so you're willing to listen to some deceptive voices. Spirits, doctrines of demons, kind of like Adam and Eve, were willing to listen to the voice of the serpent who contradicted the very words of God. And he says they're speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with an hot iron. Among the things that these doctrines of demons present are such things as forbidding to marry. And commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know, get this, the truth. Remember the Spirit would guide you into all truth 
There is the truth, and it's the same as the faith. So hang on to that, because deceiving spirits will introduce other doctrines. And those will be doctrines of demons, and they will not save you. They will corrupt you, and they will, uh, they will bring about your downfall before God, your apostasy, but they will not bring you closer to God. Now another thing, I'm turning to 2 Thessalonians now. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and I want you to notice with me verse 7. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Paul to the Thessalonians says, For the mystery of lawlessness, that is, not confining yourself to God's law, being lawless, the mystery of that is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Paul had warned about this in Acts 20 to those Ephesian elders when he told them, I told you the whole council. Then he said, grievous wolves are going to arise from among yourselves, verse 28 and 29, and they will cause, uh, and they will d- d- uh, bring about your apostasy, your downfall. So he's preaching the whole council and saying, lock yourselves into that because deception is going to be going on. And Paul says, even as the writing of 2 Thessalonians, it's already at work. Now, while you're in 2 Thessalonians 2, drop down a few verses later to verse 15. I want you to notice something about how this faith and this truth was given to people like the Thessalonians and consequently to us. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you were taught. Now, what traditions are these? These are the ones we handed. Tradition means something handed down to you. That doesn't tell you where it came from in and of itself. It doesn't tell you if it's good or bad. In and the word itself doesn't tell you whether it's good or bad. But there are some good traditions. In other words, the things that the apostles handed down to you are the traditions of God. And those are the ones you are to hold on to. Now you could have gotten them by word, he says. That is, you could have gotten them orally. Or you could have gotten them through our epistle, that is, our writings. You could get them because you heard them. You could get them because you read them. Those traditions that come from God, those are the ones you are to hang on to. And so while preaching the whole counsel of God, he says, hold on to the ones you got that you heard from us or that you read from us, but do not allow yourself to be deceived Because that spirit of lawlessness is already at work and a lot of people are going to be drawn into that great apostasy. So we ask the question, is the Roman Catholic Church a part uh, of the New Testament church that we read about? Or are they a part of the apostasy that was already at work in the first century? The whole counsel of God constituted the traditions of God. The traditions of God were given orally at first, and you see that in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit gave Peter the words orally to say, and they, the people continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. So they were listening to the apostles' doctrine orally. They didn't have it in writing yet. And then as they began to write them down, there were two ways then of getting them orally or by way of writing uh, the, the epistles that were handed down to them. And then on top of that, traditions were accumulated in the written form so that when Paul was at the end of his life and the last epistle that Paul wrote was to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter uh, 3, where he tells Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it thoroughly furnishes the man of God. Why wouldn't it? Because 
the whole counsel of God has already been given orally. Why wouldn't it be accumulated into the written form so that you can have all of what God wanted you to know in written form? Scriptures thoroughly furnish the man of God unto every good work. So that if it's a good work, you should see it in the Scriptures. If it's not, it will be missing from the Scriptures. If having popes is a good thing, it should be in the Scriptures. If having cardinals is a good thing then it should be in the scriptures. The whole council is there. The man of God is thoroughly furnished to every good work there. Uh, if if uh, counting beads and praying to Mary and those kind of things, if those are good things to do, then you should find them in the scriptures. If they're not good things to do, then they should be missing from the scriptures. And guess what? They are missing from the scriptures. And that's why Roman Catholicism says... We don't believe the Bible is enough. You're going to have to take on some traditions of men, traditions that have been handed down to you since the first century in order to come to understand Roman Catholicism is the church that Jesus started. That is, that's what they want us to believe. Now, if that apostasy was already working in the first century... Then there's two things you look at. You can look at the truth of what the apostles were delivering. And then you can look at elements of apostasy. And then you can determine where does the Roman Catholic Church fit in this. Well, we've already said then that the whole truth said nothing about Roman Catholicism. Said nothing about popes and cardinals and monks and nuns and a host of other things. So where did that come from? Well, it came from the apostasy that was already at work in the first century. What became of that apostasy in the first century? Well, what happened is it drew away disciples of Christ. So that disciples of Christ jumped on board with this apostasy. And that apostasy kept divided. And when you don't have rules, when it's a lawless operation, and you don't have to worry about the law of God anymore, or any laws confining you, then you can do pretty much anything that you want to invent. You can invent any kind of thing that you want if you have no rules. So the disciples of Christ that joined the apostasy then developed more and more into things that were apostate in nature, that is, departures from the faith in the very nature of it. Some departed from the faith, as we've said. Some turned from the truth, and they turned to fables, things that were not a part of the truth. And so that apostasy kept evolving. Among the things that we've made note of in, in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4 is two doctrines that stood out to Paul. He says they forbid to marry. Among religious apostates, they have developed this human doctrine that we want our church leaders to be totally dedicated to preaching our doctrine. And we don't want them to be distracted with marriage. Well, that's a human rule. That's not God's rule. That's a human rule. And that's why he says that doesn't come from God, that comes from the devil or his demons. It doesn't come from God, it has to come from the demonic side of things. So the apostasy then can keep developing and they can throw rules out and make them up as they go. But the apostles were saying, you Christians hang on tightly because this is, this is going to draw disciples away. And you've got to be careful not to let that happen to you. Then when you consider all that, you can, you're looking at the question of whether Roman Catholicism, as they claim, can possibly be the true church or was it part of what was already at work, already drawing disciples away. And here's what you, here's what you can determine very, very clearly from a look at the Scriptures. Number one... The earliest churches did not see themselves as the developers of truth, but the adjusters to truth. 
In other words, this body of teaching is something handed from God. It's outside of ourselves. We're drawing it into ourselves and adjusting to it. So when we see our failings, we adjust to this body of teaching. We don't make it up as we go along. So the early churches saw themselves. Like, for example, the church at Corinth, when Paul got on to them about numerous things, the man that had his father's wife, uh, the perversion of the Lord's Supper, uh, the mishandling of the miraculous gifts and powers. What did Paul do? But he says, the things that I write to you, they are the commandments of the Lord, and you're going to have to adjust to the commandments of the Lord. The earliest churches saw themselves as held to a standard higher than themselves and outside themselves, which they then tried to draw into themselves so they could adjust to it. Peter is another example. In Galatians chapter 2, Paul got all over Peter. He wasn't a pope. And he wasn't infallible in his actions. When he delivered the word of God, he was infallible in what he said from God and demonstrated from God. But he was not, and none of them were infallible as to every aspect of behavior is concerned. And in Galatians chapter 2, Peter was playing the hypocrite and Paul just crawled all over him and and told him what uh, a hypocrite he was being. Why? Because the standard is other than what Peter was doing. And Peter can't make it up. Peter can't say, well, I'm the Pope and I can do, I, I want to do it this way. You can't do that. You can't say, I get to make up the standard and I'm going to adjust the standard. What you do is you adjust yourself to the already given standard. And that's why uh, Paul got on to him the way he did. Truth did not adjust to the whims of church leaders. Otherwise, Peter could have made the truth adjust to him. Say, well, now we're going to do it this way now. It's kind of like some of the popes do. They ruled one way years ago and now they're adjusting and they're adjusting and they're adjusting and now... You know, just about anything goes now. Why? Because they see themselves as the arbiters of truth and they get to adjust it. They adjust it instead of adjusting themselves to it. And there's a great difference in those two things. Another thing that is characteristic of the New Testament Christians is they understood that I have a right to marry... And they could marry if they chose to. Paul chose not to, not because it was a rule outside himself that he couldn't. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that I have the same right as Peter's got. And Peter had a wife. And so Paul made the argument in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that I I have that right too. I'm just not using it. I'm not going to use it because I don't want to. I see an advantage of not using it right now. But hey, I'm not binding that on other people. I'm just saying that's my personal choice under the circumstances. So the apostles did marry. Peter was one who did marry. And the apostles could marry. And every Christian can marry lawfully. Those of the apostate make it a rule not to marry. Apostate churches forbid some of their priests and leaders to marry. And that creates a a lot of conflict within those leaders and a lot of problems in those churches. And it's because they listened to a doctrine of demons that said that you cannot marry. Apostate churches evolve because they don't have rules. The reason the churches that belong to the Lord try to stay the same is because they have rules from God. And they understand they have rules. If you don't have rules, you can do pretty much anything that you want to. You don't have to check it out. You can just make it up as you go along. Apostate churches evolve because they have no absolute Standard. Those who understand truth, though, understand that truth remains stationary. 
we adjust to it, it remains the same. If we depart from it, we come back to it. If we, if we forget something, we become reminded of it. If we, uh, if we neglect something, somebody reminds us to quit neglecting that. Uh, it's, it's all adjustment to that truth because truth is stationary and we have to keep adjusting ourselves to that truth. Now, as we mentioned in a moment ago, all Scripture completely, thoroughly furnished the man of God in the first century and therefore every century afterwards. So when you see that and when you understand that, there are some things that are just not found there. And I've mentioned popes are not found there, cardinals. Every Christian was a priest in the first century, every Christian And if you do not see yourself as a priest, then you need to adjust your thinking because the early disciples, every one of them were priests. However, in apostate movements, they begin to form something that's a different and a separate priesthood. And when you do that, that's part of an apostasy. Monks and nuns are not found in the scriptures. Sprinkling for baptism is not found in the scriptures. Setting up statues to worship or to, uh, to bow down to. Praying to Mary or to other saints is not found in the scriptures. Special robes and clothing is not found in the scriptures. You'd have to go outside the scriptures to look for such things as that. Or icons and relics and, and uh, the rosary and, uh, and burning of incense. And those kind of things that you see that typify some other, some other religious group. You see that because they're not anchoring themselves and holding tightly to that body of teaching that completely furnishes the man of God to every good work. So, you look at the list of things, and when you look at that list, and you're asking your question, because some of them are claiming that they are the original church. No, the original church didn't have those things. The original churches that you read about in the scriptures that thoroughly furnish you, didn't have those things. Therefore, when we ask the question, where did it come? Where did the Roman Catholic Church come from? Did it come from the scriptures? Did it come from the apostles? Or did it come from the apostasy that was already working in the first century? Did it develop and evolve as it did because of that apostasy from the truth? Or can you read about it? Can you read about it in the scriptures? And the answer is, should be quite obvious. Now, I said all that not just to, just to, uh, to expose that area, although that's scriptural for us to do that as well. But what we're, what we're trying to do is say, look, this is how it happened in the first century. The danger is just as real for us. So the way that they had, they had in the first century to keep from being pulled into that apostasy was for them to recognize what body of truth did the apostles and prophets deliver and am I anchored to that? Am I, am I adjusting my faith, my life to that? And am I committed to that? So Jude verse 3 and 4 when Paul, uh, uh, Jude wrote, he says, I wrote of the common salvation, of things that we have, in, the salvation we have in common. And I urged you to contend earnestly for the faith. The faith was that original body of teaching. Contend for that original whole counsel of God, that body of teaching that was delivered to all people, that was delivered to all the saints. If you contend earnestly for the faith, 
then that is the means by which we can keep a group of Christians from falling away, from pulling away from that truth, from splitting away from that truth. If we are devoted in our hearts, in our minds, and we're committed to that faith that was originally delivered to the saints, then we can make that church exist inside us. We can make that same spiritual body of Christ exist inside us. If it could get inside those early disciples, it gets inside us. And that's why Jesus said that the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you when you listen to the king and what the king has delivered. So contending earnestly for the faith can make a true church stand and continue to stand in any area of the world. Now the thing about that is those disciples didn't have political power in the first century. An apostate movement can develop political power, but the early disciples didn't have political power. So if you look at something that's structured that has a lot of political might over the world, it might not be the same church that you're reading about in the New Testament because it didn't have political structure and might in the world. So when you read about the abuses of things that happened in Roman Catholicism and you read of crusades and all those things, people throw that at you and say, that's the Lord's church hasn't done any better than Muslims (laughs) do. Well, the Lord's church has always done better than that. They didn't use carnal weapons. They didn't fight those kinds of battles. Their weapons of their warfare were mighty, but they weren't carnal. And so they fought battles from inside themselves. And they fought battles of minds and hearts. But they didn't fight physical battles in the first century. And therefore they're not engaged in that now. So if you're looking at a history and you're saying, well, Muslims are engaged in war and so did the church, church of the Lord. No, not the church of the Lord didn't. Maybe the apostate church did, but not the Lord's church. The Lord's church never did. It never was a political entity to start with. So when you consider all of that, don't let somebody uh, uh, draw you into that kind of, uh, kind of thinking where uh, they try to equate quote, Christianity with uh, the Muslim uh, religion and and try to draw comparisons because those comparisons are not there. Uh, The Lord's church was a group of people who advanced itself by reason, by reasoning with people on the evidence of God and uh, the evidence of Jesus Christ and the evidence of God's Word. Now, what we've got to do now is we've got to be a church who insists on checking ourselves, checking ourselves constantly by the Word of God. All adjustments are going to be on our end of things. Anything that needs to be adjusted, we're going to do that because we're adjusting to the Word of God. We're checking ourselves constantly by the Word of God. So in closing, let me ask those who have never obeyed the gospel why you haven't. Have you checked yourself? Check yourself on this. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Have you heard the Word of God? And has faith developed? Check yourself now. That's the truth, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Faith in Jesus Christ is because you listen to the gospel. You listen to the Word of God. The Word of God produces belief. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, Jesus said. He that does not believe will be damned. Now, are you going to be damned or are you going to be saved? Check yourself on that. Check yourself on repentance. Have you repented of your sins? Have you determined to leave that way of living and thinking? 
Have you checked yourself about that? Peter said to the 3,000, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Check yourself. Are you willing to confess Jesus because you believe in Him? Check yourself on that. I'm not asking you to be perfect. I'm just asking you, the Lord is asking you, are you willing to confess my name to this lost and dying world? Are you willing to stand up for Jesus and confess Him? With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Be baptized. Check yourself. See, the adjusting has got to be on our side. Have you been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins? Now, there's, that gets you in. There are some other things to do to stay in. But that gets you in to the body of Christ by the blood of Jesus Christ. And without the blood of Christ, you, nothing, none of that would even make a difference at all. But the question is, have you obeyed the gospel? And are you willing to hang on to the truth of the gospel? Are you willing to do all the adjusting on your end based on that truth of the gospel? Can we help you in any way? Please come and let your wishes be made known as we stand together and sing this song.